The Kreish case was one of the longest running legal sagas in New Zealand's history. There was something about the craziness of that time. It sucked us in. Child care worker Peter Ellis was convicted and sentenced for abusing seven preschoolers in his care. I hope one day that they are actually going to be prepared to come along and say, hello Peter, did we get it wrong? And I'll tell them, they got it wrong. For the first time in three decades, the mother of a child who was always considered the most credible witness is speaking out. Peter did not abuse our child, no matter how many people said he did. These are some excerpts of a letter that Peter wrote to our daughter. I did ring and, and say to him, I'm so sorry. Our child, who Peter Ellis was found guilty of abusing, was not abused. For the first time in three decades, the mother of a child who was always considered the most credible witness in the Christchurch Civic Crash case is speaking out. There were many victims in this whole awful, terrible saga. Peter, I think, was the victim who, it was the greatest impact. It would be easy to say he lost seven years of his life, but he lost a lot more of his life. But I do believe that our daughter, was a victim, not of Peter Ellis, but of a system that really pressured her. And I, I know that during her life, there have been times of immense shame and guilt. You will therefore be committed, each and every one of you, to the High Court for trial. The Kreish case, as it has always been called, was one of the longest-running legal sagas in New Zealand's history. It was the early 90s, and the whole country was shocked by allegations of mass sexual abuse at the Christchurch Civic Kreish. Childcare worker Peter Ellis was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison for abusing seven preschoolers in his care. His co-workers, four women, ranging in age from late 20s to mid 40s, were also charged, only later to be discharged. Like the women, Alice maintained his innocence right from the start. What is it like walking around with child abuse charges of an extremely horrific nature against your name? Well, I can't answer that because uh, I know I didn't do it. It must be an incredibly difficult time for you at the moment. I was based in Christchurch working for TV3 in the 90s and at that time I was the only journalist Peter Ellis spoke to. I did a series of interviews with him. It made me wonder how on earth this ever happened. It was a time in history where the country was gripped by this unimaginable and bizarre case in what has since been labelled a climate of hysteria. The whole thing, when I look back, I think, how did we get caught up in this? How did this happen to us? We're, we're nice, we were a nice nuclear family, we did everything right by our children, and we got caught up in it. There was something, oh, I don't want to um, be disparaging about, about other people, but there was something about the craziness of that time that became... It sucked us in. There are specialist interviewers who are being set up to interview these children. If we look back on the way that the children were interviewed, the way that the police conducted themselves. What was it like? Can we describe it as like the perfect storm? Oh, I think that's a very good a very, very good description. <clears throat> there were, <clears throat> there, there were, there was a lot of training around that time <clears throat> with ritual sexual abuse. There was, mm, probably I won't be popular for saying this, but almost a sexual abuse industry. <clears throat> um, there were books that were were widely read by many people. I, I remember a book I read, The Courage to Heal, and uh, one of the 
sentences in it that really resonated with me was always believe the child, always believe the child. It was the time, it was the time of everyone was talking about sexual abuse. And it was everywhere. Indeed it was. Something went wrong and it was nothing to do with sexual abuse of children. What was it to do with? It was to do with people that decided that it had happened. Peter, there will be people watching you now that will be saying, spare us the tears, that you are nothing more than a low-down child abuser. I hope one day that they are actually going to be prepared to come along and say, hello Peter, can you tell me, did we get it wrong? And I'll tell them, they got it wrong. What I am convinced about now is that our daughter retracted and that's the truth of the situation. This mother and her daughter agree with Alice, they got it wrong. A year into his prison term, and in the midst of his first Court of Appeal hearing, it was like a bombshell. The girl, by now 11, the oldest and most credible witness in the case, confessed she'd not been abused at all. She retracted because, as she said, I started with a wee story that just got bigger. Pretty big thing for her to do at a oh, very young age. So brave. Just so everyone can follow. Mm. Your daughter retracted. She told you this started with a little story mm. and it's got bigger and bigger. Now, you, what did you do then? Because it was in the middle of the Alice Appeal. It was, yes. It was 1994. Mm. What, we, what we did at the very outset of this situation, the whole case, was we wanted to do the right thing. So I, um, I rang Wellington and said, our child's retracted. We weren't really quite sure just what was going to, what was going to happen from that. But naturally, I had to say, she's saying it didn't happen, mm. and it, it, you need to know this. And the mantra of that time was, "Believe your child," and we believed our child when she said this has happened, and we believed our child when she said, "Actually, it didn't." The retraction was really big news at the time and a major crack in the Crown case, but it didn't really seem to make much of a difference. Today the Appeal Court upheld that evidence, despite one of the child complainants admitting only last month that she'd made up her story against Alice. The court set aside the three charges relating to that child, but upheld the 13 charges involving other children. At the time, she was considered to be in denial. Yes. So do you know what that actually means? Well, it, it meant, uh, so I was told on um, uh, uh, a few occasions later, that that retraction was a very common thing to happen for young children and that she had been abused but that she was retracting because it was really too overwhelming and powerful and she could no longer live with this. That she was in denial was the expert opinion of Nicholas Till, a senior barrister. He had been engaged to interview this mother's daughter. But what would he know about kids? Was he some sort of specialist with children? I don't know, and we never asked. But it was the barrister's so-called expert opinion that became set in stone. Her mother calls it the Crown's convenient disbelief because the denial claim became like a legal gospel and was reasserted by the Crown in all the cases and inquiries to come. She's never, ever said, actually, the second story was made up. She's been absolutely adamant. Her whole life, really, hasn't she? Her whole life, yeah. Her whole life she has said it did not happen. I imagine that was probably quite hard at times of her in her life. Yeah, yeah. To deal with that. Because Peter Alice has always been quite a big story. The crash case, is, it's never really gone away. No, it's never here gone away. Here we all are, mm. here again, 20, nearly 30 years later. Yeah. <laughs> and has she, in this time... Has she tried to uh, help Peter in any way? 
some years ago when Simon Power was uh, Minister of Justice, and um, I think that there was going to be another appeal, and at that stage we wrote and said, please look at this very seriously. Did you feel guilty? Oh, yes I did. I did. Mm. I talked to Peter over the years, not often, but I did ring and, and say to him, I'm so sorry. You said that to him? I did. Mm. And? He was so charming. <laughs> he was so, so charming because his concern at all times was, is our child okay? And also to say how very brave she was to stand up and say, this did not happen. Mm. Her daughter wrote to Peter Ellis and he replied. These are some excerpts of a letter that Peter wrote to our daughter. I have no anger or hold you responsible for what happened. You were a child. You've shown that courage over and over again with your continued conviction to stand by what you know is right. A worldwide event overtook us. I am sorry that you have taken to heart so much. You were a child and this event should never have been allowed to happen. I am proud of you. You clearly have the courage and independence to continue to be a wonderful young woman. One day I hope you will find a partner, husband and have children and be an inspiration to them as you have been to me. Kind thoughts always. Peter. Out of prison for just a few hours and Peter Ellis finds himself... Peter Ellis was released from jail in February 2000 after serving his sentence of nearly seven years. As has been a constant in this case, a large media contingent was waiting. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the public of New Zealand who have supported me over the last eight years. I want to say thank you in particular to the parents of children at the crash who have stood by me. They know who they are and I will always be moved by their support. <clears throat> I can't let this moment pass without also mentioning the tremendous support that I have received from my fellow prisoners and their families and it has been much appreciated. Finally, I want to thank my mother and my family. In particular, I mention my mother, who has given the last eight years of her life to supporting me, and I feel that she has served that sentence with me. Thank you, Mum. Peter Ellis was a free man, but he said he never really felt free because he was, after all, Peter Ellis. Right from the very beginning, he always maintained proving his innocence was not just about him and his family, but about the families and children involved. Perhaps, just perhaps, that I have spent the six and a half years fighting for them just as much as I have been fighting for clear, to clear my name. You've been fighting for the children? Of course I have. That is, that is what being a childcare worker is, is, is standing up and saying for the children. It didn't happen, and it, this is not fair on you, it's not fair on your parents. We want a full investigation into the civic crash case, and we would like the emotions torn aside and look and see what the issues are left and the people that actually drove that case. The Court of Appeal has rejected the second appeal. By the early 2000s, there'd been not just one, but two failed Court of Appeal hearings. The Ellis files are still open. The truth is out there. There were also numerous unsuccessful requests for a pardon and a royal commission of inquiry. What was achieved, though, was a lower-level ministerial inquiry, which was conducted by former Chief Justice Sir Thomas Eichelbaum. It had been ordered by the then Minister of Justice, Phil Goff. There was an inquiry. Sir Thomas Eichelbaum a carried... narrow inquiry. Exactly the inquiry that the... I did this interview with Phil Goff nearly 20 years ago. 
There had been a lot of criticism about the narrow scope of the ministerial inquiry, and because of that, there was no real surprise at Eichelbaum's findings. This case of any potential miscarriage failed by a distinct margin. He had not found it anywhere near a borderline judgment. Mr Goff, he didn't even speak to the family or the child who retracted. The child who was the oldest witness. She was the most credible witness. She said it didn't well, happen. Well, let's, let's create some balance to what you've just said. That balance, of course, was the same old narrative, that the girl was in denial, the same as the Crown's explanation whenever the issue of the retraction came up. Peter did not abuse our child, no matter how many people said he did. When your daughter, when, when your daughter found out that there was going to be a Supreme Court case all these mm. years on, how did she react knowing there was going to be yet another case? Uh, she contacted Rob Harrison. Who, of course, is Peter Ellis's lawyer. Yes. To say, what can I do? What can I do to make this terrible wrong right? What did you think when you found out he was sick and then obviously he's died? I thought, um, I thought what an absolute tragedy. I thought... I thought, how very, very unfair that he was a man who couldn't, who couldn't live the life that he had the potential to live and that he died before, he, he died before he could clear his name and, uh, and he died young. 61 is young, but Peter Ellis died a convicted sex abuser. I was listening to the radio uh, when it, it, it came out that he died, it's convicted sex abuser. Peter Ellis has died aged 61 of bladder cancer. God, that's just, what a tragedy, and a tragedy for his family. I remember when I phoned you, you just kept saying, Poor Peter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, poor Peter. Mm. If you could say anything to him. Mm. I would say I was sorry. I would say I was sorry that that I got caught up in the hype. I'd say I was sorry I wasn't stronger. And... Uh, I'd say that, that I absolutely know that he never ever abused our child and that in fact she loved him and she loved his stories and she, she has really good memories of him.